Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, there are more seats here. We can have a position here. The front row seats are the most precious ones, usually, right? <laughs> so uh, thank you again for coming. Uh, quick, you know, I want to share with you how this event started for us. So Shivani joined us two years ago. She's our chief operating officer. I started this company 10 plus years ago. 15 plus, 17 years ago. <laughs> so, hey, it's still young, man. We're growing. In fact, good news to share. We just received an email yesterday that we are an Inc. It's not public yet, but we are Inc. 5000 fastest growing company six straight years in a row. So I'll just thank you. It's, and thanks to all of you for that. Uh, but the reason this event uh, is special for me, I'll tell you this. Before Shivani joined us, uh, we did not, and I'll be the first one to admit, even though we were in years of operation for so many times, we did not focus that much on diversity. We were focused very much on growth. And especially in the tech industry, you know uh, diversity is a big, big, big challenge, right? And that has to be consciously given attention and energies to. So while the company has grown very well, uh, you know, I'll t I'm very happy to say that in two years, you know, uh, the, for us, the number of women in the company has almost grown 200% for us, which is a big milestone for us. And we can see the balance is working really well for us. And I, I want to thank Shivani very much for that. And this event, especially special for me, because when we had the first women in tech, you know, meetup, the first meetup? It's, it was an internal networking it, group. It was an internal networking group. And when Shivani mentioned that, that meetup was supposed to be running for an hour only, but it ran from five to eight and people had to be, you know, asked to leave afterwards saying, guys, we are done, please leave now, right? So, and then we saw what an opportunity exists in this industry right now to give back to the community. And uh, I'm sure Shivan is going to talk a lot about it, but um, I want to thank personally everyone for coming and the panel here for taking the time. You're all very busy. I know two of you personally, so I know how busy your schedules run and, you know, uh, amount of things you juggle. So uh, you're an inspiration to me, for, I know two of you for sure, and I'm sure after hearing your stories, I've been inspired much more. So. Thank you all. Let's put our hands together for Shivani and everyone else. Thank you. Thanks, Gunjan, for that, uh, that introduction. Um, as Gunjan said, I am Shivani York. I am the COO at In Rhythm. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to tell a little bit about who we are. We are a technology consulting company with a mission to really help enterprises build great software, but also modern cultures. From our people perspective, we really believe in 10x learning and growth um, and making sure that our teams are always growing and learning. At this event and this panel that you see today, it's part of our In Rhythm University where we get to share our passions, things that we love doing and talking about with others. So I'm really, really excited uh, to introduce a, an awesome panel with us today. Uh, we have some incredible women leaders who are here to share their experiences across the board and what it takes to have a career of impact. And that will be the theme for tonight. They're astounding leaders across technology and I'm privileged to have them here, learn from them, be inspired by them, and really understand from them what it takes to get to where they are. And also learn about their challenges, um, strategies. Uh, so it's gonna be a, a great talk and thank you for being here. I wanted to quickly introduce uh, our panel. Um, starting from all the way on the right is uh, Christine Mohan. Christine is the co-founder of Civil, a journalism platform built on blockchain and cryptocurrency technologies, and she has an impressive 25-year career behind her, um, working at media, com media and technology companies from New York City to Boston uh, to Washington, D.C. Next to uh, Christine is Catherine Levine. Catherine has built her career building and scaling successful online and technology companies. She's held all roles starting with uh, executive management to CEO to COO for multiple startups and multiple successful startups. And most recently, she was the co-founder and CEO of Artspace. And right now, we were just talking, and I know she just started a new company, uh, Cat Park and Shoes, uh, which is all about women's shoes. So we're excited to have her here. Katrina Roberts. Katrina is the Senior Vice President and Unit CEO, CIO of Global Commercial Services Technologies at American Express. She's also the global sponsor of Women in Technologies, 
and leads the diversity efforts for American Express Technology. She's also won several awards for her support for female talent. Thank you for being here. Next to Katrina is Angie Ruan. Angie is Senior Vice President of Technology at NASDAQ. With a pretty exciting career across, of leadership across Amex, NASDAQ, PayPal, eBay. At eBay, she was actually the president of Women in Tech. But her real passion is to make a difference in the world that we live in by connecting business, technology, and people together. Last but certainly not least is Natalie Seidman. Natalie's background spans management consulting, traditional market research, and alternative data with a focus on bringing clients the facts that they need to make data-driven decisions. Um, most recently, she's the managing director of all of US across Edelman Intelligence. And before that, she was at 1010 Data, NPD Group, and Citibank. Thank you, all, all of you, for being here. And please join me in giving these incredible women a warm, warm welcome tonight. As I mentioned, our theme for today is going to be impact. Having a career of impact and learning from those in the leadership positions. First, I wanted to cover why this is an important topic. We all know and acknowledge that there is a gender disparity across technology. Funny enough, the value of gender diversity is also widely acknowledged. Women across different perspectives, they bring different perspectives and approaches to business, resulting in a, not just a more inclusive environment, but also better performance for the company. But as of this month, if you look at Fortune 500 companies, that's all 500 companies, only 24, that's about 5%, are led by women. Another fact, women comprise of over half of the workforce but only occupy one quarter of the technology sector. Fact number three, across Facebook, Twitter, Apple, Google, companies that we consider to be at forefront of technology, women in leadership positions at max occupy about 28% of those leadership roles. And if you look across technology, it gets even worse. Women in executive positions occupy about 10% of overall executive roles. So now let's talk about why it matters, aside from having a really inclusive environment. Companies with female board members achieve 66% higher performance in invested capital. That's according to a large scale case study done by Deloitte. Increasing the women in top management position also increases return on equity for companies. Also another large scale company uh, study done. And according to Harvard Business Review, companies with a diverse workforce are 45% more likely to capture a new marketplace and 70% more likely to report on growth in market share. And according to the study, they basically said diversity unlocks innovation. It unlocks inno innovation by creating this environment where out of the box ideas are heard and they, they thrive. And hence, it really is great not just for company in the bottom line, it's great for innovation overall. But here is the awesome, the great thing. We as Americans believe that Having women across leadership positions makes sense. According to the research by Rockefeller Group, more than 70% of Americans say that having a woman in a leadership position would have a significant impact on issues across the board, including the gender gap, including changing policies and having a more diverse workforce. Also, according to that same study, more than 80% of us believe that not having women in leadership positions at role models really fails to inspire others from trying to achieve that scale, from, others, from other women from getting in the top positions. That's the reason why we're here today. 
We at In Rhythm believe that this is an important topic, not just for us to cover internally, but for us to really learn from these amazing women so we can change the statistics a little bit. So not only can women be inspired, but also so that we can change the conversation on why it matters. Gunjin covered you know, a little bit of the story of how we got started with this. Just a bit of a color on that. Um, women in tech uh, was started for In Rhythm as an internal networking support group by one of our amazing engineers, May. She's in the white shirt, she's in the audience. <laughs> May came to me and she said, you know, I really want to have an impact. And she said, you know, there, this is something that I really, really care about. But I want it to be more than just a conversation. I want this to be a forum where we can all sit. And, you know, right now we are at 200% growth in terms of having women um, cross tech within and rhythm. And we want to get that even better. Um, so we started this internally as a place where we can not just discuss important ideas, but also a place where we can come up with strategies. And the whole goal was that we would tackle one meaty topic. And every single time we meet, we would cover that meaty topic. I think the last time we met, it was about negotiation. And we would then figure out the strategies to help us negotiate better, or other areas where that would be blockers. But as Gunjan said, you know, once we realized that, I don't think it was two hours, I think it was close to three hours, and we all were sitting there, not because it was just great conversation, but really because we were really learning from each other's experiences. And that's when we realized that we needed to open this up out to outside. We really needed to make this a broader forum, um, and, and that's, that's what we've sort of done. And um, you know, going forward, we'll try to make this into a, a quarterly format. Um, so uh, enough about all the background, but what I wanted to do is um, I'd love to start with our panel and talk to them about how they've gotten here and what's defined them. So um, I'll start off with a few questions. Um, Katrina, you've had a really impressive career across the board. Tell us, was there a pivotal moment in your career that really defined you? or propelled you significantly towards where you're sitting today? If so, what was that moment? I'd love to hear your story a little bit. Um, okay, so uh, this is probably, it was two, I can't remember when it was. It was 2014. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, I thought I had a really loud voice, but apparently not. Is that working? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Uh, uh, I was on this upward trajectory. I was in the UK. And I, as you may have been 2013, I met my, uh, the new CIO of the company and uh, I blew it with him in my first conversation. And, and at that level, the level I was at then, you know, I might have three or four interactions a year with him. I didn't know I'd blown it until I was told afterwards. Um, <laughs> and I was devastated because, you know, I'd been hearing all these great messages about how I was gonna really go somewhere and, and I just kicked myself and I was nervous and I was trying to impress him too much. And I didn't read him and his style, I didn't know him. And so I worked incredibly hard for a year to put it right. And I knew it was in me to put it right, but I just had to work really, really hard to convince him. And about a year after, so that was the pivotal moment, the realization that I had to, I had to change my style without changing me. I'm still the same person underneath. And then about, this was, this was the year, 2014 was my year. And about a month after that, I won this uh, award, this external award, which was amazing because it just, from a company point of view, it projected the profile of the company in terms of how it supports women, and it obviously helped me a lot personally. And then a year after that, he, I stepped back down to my old role. My boss came back from New York and said, I'm sending you to New York, and I'm promoting you permanently. I then became his direct report, and then three weeks ago, he promoted me again. Um, that was my pivotal moment. That's great. That's actually very, very powerful. And Angie, you know, feeding off of what Katrina is talking about, because it sounds like what you did is you really took charge of your own career. And you, know, you took charge of your own career by changing the way that you were perceived. Um, you know, Angie, you also talked in an interview that was published in Forbes um, about your career, your career being something that you have to take control of explicitly, and also the importance of taking risks along the way. Tell us what you mean by that and how that's 
played a part in your success? Yeah, so for those people who are probably do not understand my path, so I spent about 20 some years in Bay Area and joined, uh, started from startup. If you're older enough, you probably know Netscape and AOL. <laughs> and then from there I joined eBay, when in time it was the hottest company in the world. And then, you know, went to PayPal. In 2015, I was really, really happy in Bay Area and everything, you know, mother of two and teens and everything. And I'm actually recruiting me and joined and came to New York 2015. And this year, I'm current, I moved uh, from Amex to, to NASDAQ. Again, I'm not just like changing jobs, but also I'm actually uh, changing locations and things like that. So in a, in a way, like, wow, what, you're, you must be crazy. Um, so uh, the story behind this is that actually um, when, you know, when I was, um, I never thought women is a thing, like women in tech is a thing, <laughs> until at the time I worked at eBay, and uh, the president, uh, actually CEO of eBay at the time was John Donahue, and I became, uh, I think at the time was a director, was actually director in a tech company, it was extremely a, a, a privileged a title, and they had a um, training for women leaders, what really mean by women, we, you know, they're like talking about unconscious bias, and I, I suddenly realized, oh my God, I actually didn't realize the potential of me, and actually the company helped me to understand have the potential that I have never taken advantage or understand myself. And one of the things about all the tools they ask us to actually uh, learn about ourselves, learn about you know other people, then one thing I realized what I have been doing is like, you know, really working really hard, impress, you know, trying to help everybody working really hard, but eventually I will get, you know, the rec recognition. And I realized that's not the case because career is not about just you working hard and do the things, you know, all the things. It, it's also about the influence and how people see your influence. Mm -hmm. Then, so first thing I did was, okay, they actually taught you how to like um, reach out to mentors and also really thinking, thinking you can do things. So I have done, you know, a bunch of stuff where you can reach, you know, connect to people like, like just cold calls, you know, the people that you really, really like, just send an email, say, hey, blah, uh, I really want to learn something from you. I actually, you, you will be amazed how many people reply to you to really, truly try to help them because just like now, I actually have a lot of people myself because somebody helped me. And so, and one thing also one of my mentors told me is sort of being uncomfortable for being comfortable. Uh, for being comfortable for being uncomfortable, really, so one of the things that taking, taking my, ch you know, sort of charge of my life is that if I stick in one thing for a long time, yeah, I can make it perfect and perfect, but I'm really not using my fullest potential. It's never been like a dislike for some job or anything. It's always, am I in a in nature state? So every two to three years, I'm trying to you know, wake up, Angie, you can do more. So I've always kind of evaluated me. So actually, I was talking to Ganji, and I started two company in between job. I didn't list my resume. <laughs> fail, fail. And so that's why it's amazing that you know, being the CEO, I know how hard it is because I never be able to do that. But one thing I also trying to do, that I take risks because every time I take the hardest risk, the, the, the return is so high. Like, I came across, you know, from PayPal, you know, California, PayPal's a great company, I moved to Amex. People were talking about, are you crazy, <laughs> right? Are you really crazy? The weather is, you know, 2015 weather in New York was crazy. <laughs> but I have to say, it's just, you know, every time I take those risks, it's the really best decision. And I learn so much, I connect a lot. And, you know, not just personally, as a family, I think, you know, just want to, you know, I'm a, I always declare myself, I'm a mother of two, and I'm a wife, and uh, I'm an engineering by heart, I'm a leader by training, and I'm a lifetime learner. And so I really enjoyed the journey of the change, and the taking the risk sometimes was like, you know what I'm doing here? But in the end, oh my God, that was the best decision. That's actually, that's you know, something you said about falling and being comfortable with that falling. You know, one of the things that I was reading was, studies suggest that men take far more risks in their career than women do. 
So and you also talked a little bit about you know, that conscious bias. Can you talk a bit about what that is and how you've overcome that? Yes. Oh, OK. Um, so the unconscious bias, oh, same thing. Thank you, Katrina. <laughs> You know, it, it is so interesting. I actually didn't realize um, there was a conscious bias thing. And then actually after the training, I'm so into uh, human psychology. I'm really like, I read books and podcasts. I'm so, so much into this now. It's, I don't know if you have read a book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, and you know, how the human brain works. So you have to be really efficient. That's why you have to make a lot of shortcuts. You, mm -hmm. Your prefrontal cortex, which is sort of the CPU, a lot of time you don't actually use that CPU, sorry, you know, for, for the tech audience, like really the computer, right? You do a lot of shortcuts to make a lot of decisions unconsciously. So, and, and a lot of time it's really not people saying, okay, I, you don't look like leaders because you are Angie or you're women. It's unconscious, you know, you're actually doing that. What we, you know, one is like for myself, how do I really help myself to understand that's a situation going across it? And the two things I always remind myself, because it's not people like malicious doing that, is that I have to be a purple cow. Meaning that if you don't see me as a leader, as technology, I have to really show up very brown and loud. I am here, right? So it's uncomfortable, I have to do it. That's, that's definitely one. Another thing is, I don't want to blame the systems, right? A lot of time we talk talking about glass seating. So my two words is, which early in my, in my, in my career, some uh, coach told me, it's not a glass seating, it's the sticky floor. <laughs> so it's out there, right? What it is up onto you, that's one of the things I feel like I have to take in my career myself. It is my sticky floor because I thought, oh, because they think I'm a woman, oh, they think I'm not, you know, technical, or they think I'm like Asian, or they think my accent is so bad. You can put all of that monkey, you know, talking to you, but you have to take that out. That's why I have to remind myself, like, wait a second. <laughs> you know, that's one of the things, like, we have to remind ourselves, we can do better, like, we're confident, right? <laughs> you know, I definitely echo that. So that's word of things. Like, it's my sticky floor, I have to. That. Actually, that's very interesting. The, the sticky floor versus a glass ceiling, you know, uh, Catherine, uh, you've been an advisor across many companies and you've worn many, many hats. Have you encountered that glass ceiling or sticky floor that you had to overcome? And how did you overcome that, if, if so? Um, it's, an, it's an interesting question because it, it sort of depends on the type of company that you're at and, and what role you're in and what you're trying to accomplish. So. I mean, I was lucky, there are a number of us here who worked at the New York Times in the early days, and from that perspective, I started off when I was very young, and I was given a lot of responsibility there. Um, we were part of the digital division, we were creating something new, and I was part of the executive team. And from that perspective, it was a terrific company. It was one that promoted women. It had many, many leaders um, who were women, including the CEO of the company, who happened to have been a mentor of mine. So, in that situation, you know, I feel lucky, and one of the things that I, I very often give as a, an advice is to, to find a mentor, and that mentor could be your boss, but it doesn't have to be your boss. It's somebody who you really admire, somebody who you feel like you can be honest with, somebody who, who you feel like you, you want to aspire to in many ways. And I was lucky, and I had that early in my career from women, which was unusual. It was, it was more common in the media business, but very unusual in the tech business. And I also had a very supportive boss who was a man. Um, so I had it both ways and both were mentors. In that situation, I don't feel like there was a glass ceiling because the CEO was a woman. And you know, there is very often that saying, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And I never felt that there. Um, I left in 2005 because I got in a similar situation where I was just feeling like there was inertia. And I said to myself, I was 35, like, am I going to stay here forever or am I going to go try something else? Right? And, and many people do, but I said, you know, I, there's, I've got to try something new. So, so I left, I started consulting for a number of companies and, and pretty quickly got a, a, a role as the chief operating officer of a company called Daily Candy, 
which some of you may remember, some of you may not. Um, it was, it was a, a very hot company, I want to say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that was geared solely and exclusively towards women. And it was really one of the only places that women would go to. It was an email newsletter to find out what was going on, to be in the know of a particular city. Um, and in that situation, um, it was, I had, there was a CEO above me who was a man, and then there was the board of the company, which was all men. And um, I, again, I didn't feel like it was a glass ceiling, but I did slightly feel like um, I wasn't initially being utilized in the best way. And it took a, lo it took a while for, for the CEO and I, who now have become friends, but who, to really get in a groove, to, 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 for him to be able to let up some reins and be able to let me do my job. And so that was, a, that was definitely a process that required, um, for the first time in my career, a lot of advocating for myself. Because in, in, some, in many, many times in big companies that have lots of resources, that have um, processes in place, and, and HR, and succession planning, and all the stuff that the Times had, certainly did not exist in a young, in a young startup. So it was the first time I really had to ad advocate for myself and really kind of prove myself in a new, in a new way. Um, again, did not feel like it was a glass ceiling, but more of a somewhat of a sticky floor. Um, I, I got over that, and when the company got acquired, this was an interesting situation. We were acquired um, uh, in 2009. Um, the CEO decided to leave, and um, I was given his job, which was great um, in many ways. However, you know, it didn't come with the same level of compensation and the same title that he had, which, of course, um, and I, you know, it, it sort of makes you feel like, is it because I'm a woman? Is it because, what's the situation here? Why would I, why would that be happening? It could be because of a big company or not. But that was also one of the first times where I felt, okay. And it takes a while, I think, to get up in your career to really feel where the glass ceiling sticky floor is. Because when you're, when you're just getting started, there's so much opportunity for you that you can go in a million different places. Then you get to a certain level and you, it start, you start to see things that you maybe never saw before. Um, so, but in any case, I eventually, I eventually got the title and but I ended up leaving that company and talking about taking risks, Angie said, this was the first time where I said, you know, if I'm really gonna do what I wanna do and really make a big impact, I'm gonna start my own company. Mm -hmm. Which was it? This, the most, um, I would say most interesting, creative, and challenging part of my entire career, which is going out on your own, raising money, being responsible for everything from putting the chairs together to raising the money, to um, you know being responsible for employees and payroll and you know everything that anybody here who's an entrepreneur can live with and can can understand really, really deeply, and that kind of a risk. Um, was really, really scary. And there were definitely times where I was like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? And this, what I learned during this period of time was something, and again, I'll, I'll talk about everything you learn, because you learn something new in every period of your life, was to ask for help. Because all along, even though I had these mentors who were sort of guiding me along, I never felt that comfortable asking for help myself. It was always like, I have to be the woman, I have to do this, I can do this. I can do it on my own, and if I ask for help, it's some form of weakness. And that, in that period of time in my life where I was starting my own company, I really learned how to ask for help. I was always good at giving help, advising other people, but asking for it myself was really difficult. So one of the things I, I also say to people, try to learn that younger than I did, <laughs> because people are there, there are many, many people around you who care about you, who, colleagues, mentors, coaches, who have the resources and, and really do want to help. So that's one of the things that I learned at that period of time. And then I went through the sale of that company, which was really exciting, and I decided to go out and do it again, which is, <laughs> you learn something new and during every period of time. So I, I don't think I ever felt there was um, a glass ceiling, but I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing, 
as a woman in technology, I'd be very surprised if somebody didn't come across some form of um, roadblock that is somehow related to being a woman. Um, and I felt it in the money raising phase um, from, a, a, from the VC community, which, you know, I have a lot of respect for the VC community, but unfortunately there's just not a lot of women out there. And the company that I had started was much more geared towards women than it was geared towards men. And so to sit across from a table of, you know, 12 men who look very much the same, dress very much the same, and don't know how to, you know, evaluate a company because they say they have to go home and ask their wives whether this is something of interest. That was really the first time in my life where I felt, wow, you know, I don't know whether it's a glass ceiling, but it's certainly a, an obstacle that would probably not exist if I was, you know, 25 in a hoodie. So, um, that being said, I do think, which I am neither 25, nor do I wear hoodies, and I'm not a man. But uh, all three of those things are, are not gonna change. But I do think um, forums like this, that the, the communications that we're having in the industry right now, more VCs, more people, more women in leadership positions in corporate America, in my mind, is just as important as, if not more important, as, as women in VC. Because in my opinion, it's about who controls the sources of capital in this country. Because who controls the source of capital in this country can then deliver those, that capital to other young entrepreneurs who happen to be, you know, women. So. I will say one thing about hoodies, they're coming back. So. <laughs> Um, and actually, you know, it's interesting what you mentioned about VCs and uh, women in funding. You know, Christine, you're in a very unique position, right? Because you're not only able to change the conversation within the company that you're sitting in, but you've started a new media and journalism company, uh, Civil, that's founded on black blockchain. But really, that uh, it, you have that ability to change the conversation for how it's happening across the board, because it is journalism. Um, tell me why diversity and females in technology are important and how the company and you're doing your part to make sure that we have a diverse point of view represented in journalism. Okay. So I'm going to back up a little bit um, and explain to you why I think diversity is so uh, important in um, media and tech, which you can't really get more old white male than media and tech mm -hmm. and advertising. Uh, I started, I had a couple different jobs out of school. Um, I'd always been English major, writer, reader, always learning. Um, found out I could actually translate and write for different industries. Um, so I was in DC for a couple years. Um, then came up and, and joined what was then, I didn't know this, but a startup in publishing because there was a pool table in the hallway and there were dogs and bikes and this was back in the early 90s. So we didn't call them startups then. But, um, I just started noticing that um, you know the women were, were the senior women were doing all the work and the men were leading the companies and so I just started thinking about that a little bit and uh, I actually st um, just kept learning was really fascinated by tech um, this was like 97 98 99 um, I was reading magazines like Fast Company and Red Herring and all these this fascinating new thing was happening um, wasn't even maybe called the internet back then. So I just managed to keep networking. And to me, that's been the most important thing my whole career is keep meeting people. Um, you never know where they're going to end up. There are people that I met when I was first couple months here in New York that I'm still friendly with. And as we grow up, we all get more senior and we have more connections and, and um, people start interesting companies. And so it's, that is core. And um, also, um, this is meandering a little bit, but also build trust in the companies you're working in. Um, I was at the New York Times for about six or seven years, and I probably had four or five different positions, and it was because when people asked me to do things, I would do them, or I'd raise my hand, or I'd stay late, and, and be a teammate and a collaborator. And so when things would open up across the company, someone would say, hey, you, would you be interested in doing this, or can you help us finish this project or something? And it's because you're there doing work late, and you are always saying yes. And I find that, frankly, Sometimes younger folks um, that I've come across don't know that, don't understand that, don't understand that it's like one big table, as they say, in the waitressing business and restaurant business. And um, helping other people when they need help on a project is never forgotten. So anyway, um, back to tech. I um, uh, was at a startup um, in Cambridge that was uh, acquired by the New York Times Company in 99. Um, decided that this was a huge opportunity. Um, a lot of the folks at the company were very interested in building the tech, but not necessarily interested in doing basically the networking to make sure that 
New York Times company was happy, knew what we were doing, so I raised my hand to um, move to New York, transfer, and do PR across the six digital units, and that's where I met Catherine. And Siobhan, you were a little later, and then Linda Tepidino said, who was my boss as well. Actually, you were both my bosses at one point, so a lot of awesome women bosses and colleagues at the New York Times. Um, but again, um, you start seeing, um, we definitely had some women at very top roles, um, but when you sometimes go down to the director or VP level, it turns out to be a lot of men. And again, um, the lack of diversity in all different ways. Um, is uh, pretty astounding in some of these industries. And I was going to a lot of conferences, and that's where it really became clear, where I could count on one hand people of color at a tech conference, um, GLBT at a tech conference. Uh, so I just kind of was woke, <laughs> and uh, I really paid attention to that. And when I run conferences, I've made sure that um, we do the uh, outreach we need to do, both for panels and also for attendees, and that we really work hard if we have to, to um, you know, whether it's scholarships or whatever, because you find in big companies, they do not may open up the budgets to, for younger people to go to conferences. And again, it's that networking. It's meeting people in your industry, across your industry. Traveling to a conference um, is a pretty big deal um, in your 20s and 30s, and it's so important to be doing. And um, sometimes it's the, the same kind of guys who are doing it. So um, came to Civil, um, actually had been, um, Thinking about media, but realizing that media has changed a lot, um, and advertising has changed, and, and companies are getting smaller, and the, the pie is getting smaller. So, looked into um, a friend, another friend from New York Times recommended blockchain, uh, looked, uh, got me to look into it, um, really did some research there, started doing meetups. So, all last summer, I was going to tons of meetups. I didn't know anything about blockchain, and the way I learn about something is meeting the people and doing the reading. And through that network, I realized there was a company called Consensus in Brooklyn. They do a, um, they're a big incubator. I thought I got to work there. And then I just found within that company there was a journalism project. So that wed my journalism passion as well as my technology. We are very fortunate that the funder, I was number three, and the founder and the CEO um, is only about 30. So I was definitely the oldest person at that company until very, very uh, recently when Vivian Schiller joined us, who's an amazing woman, and again, um, we are lucky to have uh, a woman in media like this at our company. Uh, so to wrap this up, um, we have eight founders. It's kind of a thing in blockchain. It's decentralized. The management is spread out. So eight of us are co-founders. Co of that eight, five are women. So that's pretty rare. It's a diverse group. And we are really fighting to keep it that way. We've got 10 out of 23 are women. Um, we're trying to also work in diversity outside of New York. We have a couple of folks in DC and California and Warsaw, but we're really pushing to make sure that we expand the geography globally because again, diversity is all different types of diversity and we are building products, we're building newsrooms, we're building newsrooms across all different types of topics. And if everyone building these tools looks the same and we hire newsrooms that look the same, then we're gonna be a pretty boring company. So um, I'm just really excited about blockchain. There is an opportunity here. Um, it's a new technology, it's a new industry. Um, we can hopefully fight to right the wrongs. There's still plenty and plenty of one type of person in that industry, but I think it's young enough that we can actually make a difference. So. That's great. Um, so something that uh, you said, uh, Christine, that also Angie uh, had said earlier, it, it's more than hard work. It's about influence. I think you, you called it influence. Uh, you talked about networking a bit. Um, you know, I, I was reading something the other day, and it said women were more likelier to be considered top performers at work but less likely to be promoted overall. So there is more than just hard work. It is about you know sort of the whole package and making sure that you're doing your part two network. Um, you know, which kind of brings me to the other point is how do you get promoted? You know, Natalie, you know, you've had a pretty terrific career across the board from 1010 Data to Citibank um, and now to Edelman Intelligence. What's the most important piece of advice that you would give to get ahead? To get promoted, how did you sort of you know get ahead in your career as you've gone from one place to another? Yeah. So um, so there's two things that I want to talk about there and kind of draw on some experiences that I've had. One is working hard and what you could do to work hard, and there's an aspect of that, and I think that's very important. But I've never gotten promoted because I worked hard alone. So what I would say is I think working hard is table stakes and that's gotta be there. 
Um, I think raising your hand, which a few people have now said, and being able to help people out and not really think about um, what your role is, what your scope is, whether or not it's your job, whether or not you're always the one who's raising your hand, and just being willing to do that is a really important thing to do and to embrace. Um, and I would say not only early on in your career, but in general. But I will also say that if you think that that's what's going to get you promoted, it's just not going to be the thing. Um, and just some examples that I could share and um, some pitfalls. I think when you were talking about screwing up, I, I, you know, it kind of made me think of an experience that I wanted to share. Um, I started my career in management consulting. I left consulting to go to Citigroup. They were a client. You know, that's kind of a typical thing. They snapped me up. I was pretty kind of young and cheap. Compensation wise, um, and they figured they can get me to do that work in house for a lot less, and so I did that at Citigroup for a while. And at the time, um, I had my daughter who, um, when she was two years old, I didn't really see her that much because we moved to the suburbs. And I was working really hard, and I just figured I need to find a job that's local to where I live. And so this wasn't a promotion, but something I wanted to share. I was kind of like, look, I need to figure this out. And I started looking for companies that were in Long Island, which is where I live. And I found a company called the MPD Group. And I was like, wow, this is a real company. And I could like do real work here and still continue my career. And so what I did is I wrote a letter to the CEO. And it wasn't a tiny company. At the time, um, it was, MPD was about 1,400 people. And Todd you know, was the CEO and the owner of that company. And I sent him an email that basically said, not really sure what I could do for you all, but here's my background. I've done market research, I've done consulting. You know, maybe I can come work here. And so the reason I tell that story is that was an example of just putting yourself out there. And yes, I did work hard and I was pretty confident in my abilities, but I also was willing to take the risk and take a shot at putting myself out there. And what he did, the CEO, he was like, I don't know what she could do for me. But he sent my resume to all the division heads at MPD at the time, and a few of them wanted to talk to me, and that's kind of how I ended up working there. And then when I was there for about five years, I was running our beauty division at the time, MPD is a market research company. We were starting up a financial services business, and I had a financial services background, and I was kind of like, I'm kind of tired of tracking lipstick sales. I want to do something. <laughs> I mean, that, that's really what I thought, and um, I raised my hand to head up and start our financial services business. And I came into that role kind of thinking that the hard work that I had done in beauty would kind of be enough and really didn't take the time to advocate for myself and really didn't take the time to talk about my experience. I sort of came in assuming that the person who made that hiring decision would just know like all the great stuff that I did and he didn't. And I didn't get that job and it actually went to somebody else. Um, and so that was a lesson for me and kind of like a I screwed up kind of opportunity. And um, I really wanted to be part of that business. So I said, you know what, that's fine. And you kind of know the story, so I keep looking at you. I said, <laughs> I still want to be part of financial services and I don't have to run it. I'll just do something else. So I took a product and marketing role, which was an individual contributor role at the time, um, to work in financial services, which was a new business at MPD. Um, and kind of gave up running this other business that I was running. And it took me a year working alongside with the guy who ended up getting the job um, to really, like, I just made the decision that I am not going to, I'm just going to assume that I'm running the business anyway and behave accordingly. <laughs> like, that, that really is, and I'm not saying that I was obnoxious, I'm not saying I elbowed my way into things, but I did the work that it took to start up that business, even though I wasn't running it. And a year later, he was offered another opportunity, and I came back to the same guy that didn't give me the job in the first place, and I was like, can I have the job now? <laughs> and that's how I was promoted, to run that business, and I was super proud of that. We scaled that business, and it ended up being very successful, so that's just an example I wanted to share. The lesson from that is, yeah, you should work hard. Yeah, you need to put yourself out there, but you also need to advocate for yourself. And then the other part of it is, just because you get passed over for a promotion doesn't mean that you're not going to eventually get it. So, you know, I think not giving up is a really important lesson. I think 
there's time to get things done and there's a lot of time to get things done. There's no kind of setting time limits for yourself has been a lesson for me that's been very valuable and very helpful. And you know, that's kind of what I would share in terms of promotion. And then beyond that, you know, I've had some success just taking risks like that and just kind of being okay with failure. So my next job at 1010 Data, I wanted to get into the big data space. I felt like I was getting kind of stale in market research. And 1010 was a company that I knew and I admired and um, I was interested in. And so I kind of did the same thing. I guess I'm, I'm a one-trick pony. <laughs> I, um, but it works. But it works, right? If it works. So I, um, at that point, we had LinkedIn, which was awesome, because I didn't have LinkedIn before. And I emailed that CEO. And basically, with the same kind of spiel, I said, hey, not really sure what I could do for you all, but I really like your company. Can I come talk to you? And I emailed him. And he got back to me. And so I ended up working at 1010. And so I've had some success by just taking some risk and having the confidence to at least try. And also having a little kind of awareness like that I might fail. And if I do, that's OK. And I'm going to try again. That's great. Uh, I think, Natalie, you, know, you hit on something. Um, this is on. Where you said you, know, you were an advocate for yourself. You made yourself visible. And, and to me, that translates into sort of making yourself the hero of your own story, right? We, we all have to have a story, and each story has a hero. And in your own story, you have to be that hero. Um, so Katrina, that brings me back to you in terms of you know, your story and you being the hero of your, your story. What is your superpower? Uh, what's that passion that drives you every day? Um, what's that superpower that makes you want to have an impact every day? <laughs> Although the, there's two parts of my, my career that I really love. There's one part that's the everyday part, and there's the one part that's the lasting part. The everyday part is just the excitement when we launch new products that really make a difference to customers. I mean, that's basically why I'm paid to do my job. <laughs> and I love that bit of it. And I do, get, I do run around the office, and you will remember, I, I do get quite excited when we launch things. Um, so maybe English in reserve, and when we launch products, I get very excited. <laughs> so that's my everyday thing of you know, the fact that I can make an immediate impact, my team can make an immediate impact on customers. But that's not really why I go to work. That's fun, but I go to work because when I'm gone, I sometimes joke when you're on my gravestone, what I would like written is that she made a difference in people's lives. That's what I really care about. I've been really lucky. I've had an incredible career. I love my job. Sometimes I hate it, but most <laughs> of the time I love it. Um, I've learned a lot. I've met some incredible people who've had lasting, lasting impacts, this, including this lady here, on my life, and have become dear friends. And I think I owe it to all the people that helped me. And I've had a lot of people that have helped me willingly. I think it was Angie that said, people will help you. It's amazing how people will help you, men and women equally. I've had some amazing male role models. I've had some amazing female role models. I want to give that back to those that will come after me. Anyone can do what I did. I'm not a genius by any means. I don't have a computer science degree. I did hotel and catering management. I mean, that's the weirdest degree ever. I wanted to run a hotel until I realized the pay was terrible and you had to work really, really bad hours. Um, so I decided that wasn't a great strategy because I love shoes. I want to talk about your company. <laughs> and shoes are expensive, very expensive. Um, so I just want to give something back. And I want, I want everyone, men or women, to have what I've had because I am very lucky have had the career I've had, and I hope it goes on for a little bit longer. So my job is to give back to others. So I spend a lot of time coaching, mentoring. I don't care what level someone's at. It doesn't matter to me. Um, if I see something, that magic thing in someone, I mean, like Danielle, who joined me three weeks ago, I, I saw the magic in her when um, I interviewed her. And I know she's going to do great things. And I would like her to do great things for American Express, being totally selfish, because I love the company. But wherever she ends up doing great things, that's a, that's a good thing for the world at large. So that's what I care about. That's, that's really great. I mean, I think uh, you hit on um, a topic that has come up a couple of times, which is coaching, mentoring, and, and sort of having that mentor that guides you, and also the importance of passion. Now, Angie, 
you've not only built engineering organizations, but you are also the president of eBay for Women in Tech. So I know there's a lot of passion for what you've sort of done, you know, across the board. Um, what was your most important lesson learned running any of the organizations that you run? Um, and how have mentors, uh, which Katrina talked about, have played a role in helping you get ahead? Um, I think early on I talked about a story that I didn't know about this unconscious bias and then becomes really passionate about it. And, and actually before it becomes the um, president of EWIT, I have a fa failure story. Can I share that? Of Am I? So, and that actually going back to why I'm really passionate. So when I realized um, about this unconscious bias, women in tech, women in leadership as being really a, a problem in a society. And I learned a lot of things. I got, I got educated by the company, helped me to send all the kind of training and come back. I was just so motivated. I said, I wanted to really contribute, not just for myself, for the rest of the women in eBay. And so at that time, eBay was really into getting to and you know, helping women to be successful. I mean, John Donahue who is just amazing CEO. Uh, by the way, if you don't know about him, his wife, he, had, he, was, he, he was stay home dad for three years to support his wife, who's a uh, computer, who was a professor in Stanford, and actually he used to work, she used to work for Obama, uh, Obama in, in a UN, head of UN. Amazing, she, she's, she, you know, uh, John Donnelly's wife is just amazing lady. And he talked about how, thinking about being a woman, how hard it is, and actually he had been in a woman role, that's why. Anyway, the story in short is that when, when I was being educated about this, I said, I want to be, I want to help others, what I have learned. And there was, uh, they created a role called uh, women's, uh, at that time it was like diversity officer, they don't call it that way, but they actually call it head of win. I actually applied for that job. I was so passionate, I wanted to give even, even up my engineering job and apply for that job. I actually spent like, you know, hire a professional coach and did all the things. And I thought I was like number one candidate and I was just, just a passion. And you know, I actually uh, was the last round, like, round of interview, and I lost. And I was like, oh my god, like, how could, I was so passionate, why not be able to get this job? And um, they, they told us they're actually better candidate. So we suggest you're going back to your day job, which is running engineering team. So that was sort of a setback. Like, wait a second. <laughs> I, you know, and what actually happened going back to, so when, when I would come, they actually trying to have a women president of technology a president across, not like a women, uh, a diversity officer. And they reach out to me, they said, Angie, we know how passionate you are in this area. Why don't you run this grassroots organization where you're still running your day job, you actually can actually influence. So, you know, one of the things I realized, sometimes a failure, I think I really like your story. You thought you were actually setting back, but what, what I did was I let people know my passion. I also later on learned that the reason they actually declined my job was they really want me to go back to an engineering job. It's actually more important you will be a role model, being a leader. And later on bec becomes a president of eWay, you can use in a grassroots effort. So I just really, really blessed with opportunities, you know, company given to me. And then, you know, because I think I really like the fact you have to show yourself there, mm -hmm. even though that was a failure. So be, running those grassroots organization, it, it really helped me. What happened is that because it's, it, you have this freedom. It's not like you have a job, you deliver revenues and this and that. You're in this environment, I know Katrina is really good at that. You're in this environment, there's all those women or men helping women to be successful, but it's like there's, there's no, like everybody treated you as special. This is like a volunteering work and you're actually, at the time I interact with the exec in the company and they just want to help you. And then there's no like, you have to be a certain level to be a certain leader. It's like leadership without authority. And I, f I felt that during the time when I would become the president of EWIT, I grew the uh, membership from like uh, 500 to like 2,000 in two years. And it, my leadership grew the, the fastest because 
because of that environment that I didn't have any risk of if I fail, what happened? Because you know I'm not running like business, like revenue, anything. And that what I would say for any of you guys who have a passion for something, volunteering to do your work, not only just show your passion, do the great stuff, but also you learn your leadership, you know, the, the easiest way. So that's great, Angie. I mean I think uh, you know that the ability to take something that you're passionate about and drive it in your business, I think, is what really differentiates people who are good from people who are great. Um, you know, Christine, as civil sort of comes into its being with cryptocurrency and, and blockchain, um, you've worked, as you mentioned, you know, across several media organizations. We worked together at New York Times, and I know you went to Wall Street Journal. Tell us the change that you are seeing, not just across tech, but across tech, uh, media from where we were to where we're headed and are, change, are things changing for better or are we kind of remaining stagnant and what really needs to happen in order for us to take a step forward if not? That's a tough question. Um, <laughs> I want to say it's improving um, but again when you go to some of these conferences especially in crypt cryptocurrency and there's even like a term crypto grows um, it's People are understanding that to build any technology, you need lots of different voices, lots of different people in that room, different people writing the code, right? Because if everyone comes from the same backgrounds and the same schools and the same MBAs, um, you end up with a pretty um, vanilla product or that product will fail ultimately. That product will not succeed in a way, as you mentioned before. Um, it will not scale, it will not be adopted in the, in the same way. Um, so I want to say there's definitely more understanding um, there's definitely more understanding that you can't be what you can't see. And recently, a couple months ago, the FT, uh, my Financial Times, uh, actually said the conferences that they sponsor, the conferences that, that they do, um, they were, there's no more mantles, i.e. no all-male panels. And some of them, <laughs> which is great, right? Um, but that's, that's a big deal, because that means they will not put their money against other conferences if it's all men. And also, some, some people have taken a step further and saying women moderators don't count. It has to be a man or a woman moderating and a woman on the panel. So I think that's a big, big step. And I was actually at a blockchain conference, and, and a young guy I work with, it was an all-male panel. And he actually stepped down, and he, said, and he knew a woman in the, state, in the audience, and he's like, you get up there. Which was great. I mean, I have never seen that before, but I definitely think people are more aware. They're more aware of diverse voices. Um, and, and I think what's interesting is what makes me nervous is um, we're already thinking of succession planning, and, and we're going to be building newsrooms um, in all different areas. And there's a, just like WordPress developers five, ten years ago are very scarce, and, and you can work wherever you want because you can write your ticket and um, get great jobs. Blockchain developers are like a smaller, smaller. Um, niche and not a lot of folks have learned how to code for blockchain. It's a couple extra um, uh, computer languages. So we're already saying we don't have to just promote blockchain uh, to uh, colleges. We need to go deeper and, and, and younger and get people understanding uh, because where I think the success will happen um, in this world, in other worlds, AI, VR, and um, newer technologies is it's it's not just like a technology revolution, it's a social revolution. So the things that blockchain can impact are everything from identity to privacy, to um, supply chain management, to provenance, whether that's wine or art or, and, and there's just, there's not a, a vertical in the world that doesn't have a blockchain application. So I think that's where the diversity could really happen. And to me, one of my favorite projects at Consensus is identity. And they, they build things that, like fingerprint things, so you can vote and make sure it's your vote. And, but if there's a bunch of guys on that, comp on that, on that project, which there are, um, how in the world can you build identity projects if, you know, if you're not a diverse company? So there's still um, a ways to go. But I do think that um, the, the breadth of what you can do with some of these technologies and the fact that um, you know, people are growing up with phones in their hands and technology is a way of life and they want to make it really work well and really impact, I think that's a, that's a big difference. That's great. So I think oh, one of the things that I remember reading um, across product development, so you, you mentioned sort of product development, which, is, which may end up being male-centric, and the product that you develop is male-centric. I think Apple, Pay, Apple uh, Health, when they first came out with their first version of Apple Health, um, it didn't take into account women's health. 
because it was built by all males. It didn't have a period of tracker. It didn't. No, so, uh, you know, something that most women know every. And I mean, that's a huge hole. It's, it's, it was a joke in the industry. Right. And that's the joke. To, to build Sorry, a product, you know, not taking half of the population of the world into account that accounts for people's health was, you know, was pretty much a joke. So it's, you know, when you talk about uh, industry changing and the conversations changing, I, I love hearing that, you know, the, the panels and the, the fact that you really want to make sure that a diverse point of view not only is represented in conversations, but also product development as well. Um, you know, which I, I'd love to sort of, you know, Catherine, as you were talking about um, your career development across technology and media, how did you get into technology? And what's something that really excites you about this industry and, and any stumbling blocks that you know, you've sort of run across in your career that may have held you back? Okay, so, um, so the first question is how did I get into technology? Because I, I was definitely not a coder. I had taken one coding class in college and I actually found it really interesting because it is in many ways creative. Um, and uh, I'd always thought I'd be in a, like a film or television or something. You know, I was more of a liberal arts person, but I did have a business degree in undergrad. And I, so I said, I'm going to probably go into something that combines two of those things. And I ended up, my first job out of college was actually at the New York Times in their magazine division. And at that point in time, I'm going to age myself, but there was no internet. Or if there was, it was really only being used by the government. Um, so <laughs> there were still fax machines. Um, <laughs> and phones on desks. I know. So, um, but there was this new thing called electronic media, and AOL was actually just getting started. And the New York Times had done a deal with AOL. Uh, via Le LexisNexis, I think, which is another old company. But in, in any case, I became very interested in what was new and what could happen with all this new technology. And it just started fascinating me. And then I went to business school, and when I came out in 1996, it was the very early days of Yahoo, and, and eBay hadn't even started, I don't believe, at that time. Maybe it was 98. Uh, 98. Um, and I, I went immediately to a startup after business school that I had been working with while I was there. And it was called Firefly. And it was a movie and music recommendation service that had many, if, if you can believe it, it was 1996, many of the concepts that are now in Spotify and in Facebook were things that we were working on and developing back in 1996. The problem was it still took five minutes to download one web page. <laughs> and there were no mobile phones. Um, so. We were way, way, way too early. But that being said, I just became fascinated by this, and I, I, I just knew from that moment, I felt really lucky that I had found something that I was really passionate about. Um, and the second question was, how did I get into technology? What were some of the roadblocks, and what am I seeing? Yeah, what, what are see? some stumbling blocks that maybe ended up becoming a lesson? Um, so I think some, some stumbling blocks along the way and were, um, we're not having an engineering background in, in a technology business and having more of a business background in a technology business where you're really reliant on the engineering team to build what it is you're, you're thinking about and not knowing whether that was hard or easy or how long that should really take and how to, how to learn the language to speak to engineers so that, so that you could communicate what the... the um, requirements were from either a business or a user perspective into, into engineering speak. And I think in the early days, um, that was really difficult for me. But I think um, having taken that one engineering class in college and understanding logic and, and sitting down and really um, kind of befriending the engineers and, and trying to get you know, involved with them, how they speak, what, what works over time, I kind of learned. Um, Certainly not to code, and I have such respect for engineers because I think it's an incredibly creative endeavor to be an engineer. It is not just like you know a dark room. It's you're building something which, in my mind, is just by nature creative. Um, so that was one of the stumbling blocks that I, that I felt along the way that I really had to overcome, and it was my confidence also. 
you know, to be able to say, okay, now I really get this and I can push back and I can understand how long this, this, this project may be a small project, this may, may, may be a big project. So that gaining the confidence to be able to, to, to really communicate with engineers. What, what I see in the industry um, as it relates to the conversation we're having right now, I think it, I'm really optimistic about. Um, and that is that people are having conversations that they've never had before. Yes, we have a long way to go. Um, women are much less afraid to speak up in a world that we live in today. I think the younger generation has the tools that we didn't have in, an, in, a, in when I started out which are things like Twitter and Facebook and, and all of social media and, and the way that, that, you know, the next generation below me promotes themselves. is just not something that we, we, of my generation, grew up with. It was sort of much more in the early days, put your head down, work hard, and, you know, just get your job done. And I, so I'm very optimistic about um, the passion, the... Um, the willingness to have the conversation that's, that's a difficult one um, and for, um, and, and frankly, the, the, um, the boldness of the generation or two below, you know, behind, behind me or many of us on this panel. I'm really, I'm really optimistic and, and proud, proud of them. That's great. Um, I think, you know, another theme that I'm seeing across the table is that theme of being bold and, uh, you know, and taking those risks. And really, Natalie, when you were talking about, you kind of raised your hand several times. You're like, there's a position. I'm just going to go email the CEO and say, hey, I can help here. I, you know, I'd love to sort of take that position. Um, and you sort of talking about the confidence and making sure that, you know, that, that lack of confidence is sometimes what holds us back from um, not only going for certain positions, but um, actually even thinking that we can raise our hand for it. You know, there was a, a, an article a while back that's widely sort of quoted where men uh, feel like, I think the, the study had said that they have to be confident only about 40 to 60% of the time in order to really raise their hand and say, yes, I can do this job, whereas women feel like they have to know it 100% yes. to really go for it. Actually, uh, can I interject for one second? Sure. We, after reading that research, we've actually changed the way we write job descriptions. Because there's also kind of a male way to write a job description and a female way to write a job description, and we realize that you you actually have to be really careful how you write it because women will discount themselves and they'll, they'll say, "I haven't done this, I haven't done this, I haven't done this," and won't even apply. That's no, and, and I think it's you know the importance of making sure that you believe in yourself enough, and you know that's one of the reasons I want to come back to Natalie to you, in terms of talking about the confidence gap. You know, for women. What is that confidence gap? Do you think that we hold ourselves back at times? And how did you overcome that? Because obviously every single position that you've taken, you've just sort of gone out there. Yeah, so the confidence gap, just to kind of define it for everyone in case you're not sure or didn't know, is you know there's a lot of research out there that basically says that women tend to uh, not give themselves the break, not raise their hand as much, not feel as qualified for certain positions as men do. And, um, and actually what I think is really interesting is that the women of sort of the younger generations, as you said, Catherine, that I'm observing, um, I'm seeing less of that. And I wonder if that's because it's a self-selected group of women who are in the space and just by being there, they've overcome the confidence gap. But that whole idea of like that imposter phenomenon, and I'm just curious because there's a group of young women, um, how many people have felt like if you're at a table or you're in an interview or you've been given a break where you kind of feel like, oh my God, they don't really know that I'm not really gonna be able to do this and they're gonna find me out. Like, I don't know how many people have felt that, but that's what the confidence gap really is. And, you know, I talk to myself to this day all the time. I feel that way very, very often, where I have to tell myself and give myself a little pep talk about it. And I'm seeing actually younger women, women who are entering the workforce now, 
I actually, I'm observing a lot more confidence. I've actually also read that that confidence gap goes away as you age, and women in their 20s kind of, it's a wider gap, and as you get to your 50s, which I'm almost there, like, there is no gap. So I'm really looking forward to that. But, <laughs> but what I will say is, and this is advice that a mentor has given me, is it's head trash, and you kind of have to tell yourself to not bring that head trash into those conversations with you. And kind of, it, it really is telling yourself and reminding yourself of your accomplishments, of the things that you want to do, and also being willing to fail because I think that that helps narrow the confidence gap. And being able to say to yourself, I'm going to try this even though I'm not 100% sure that I could do it, but I believe in myself and I'm going to try it anyway. And if I try it, and I'm not 100% successful, that's OK. I'm going to learn from it, and I'm going to try again. And frankly, I experience this to this day all the time. Um, I, you know, I'm in sales. I'm often sitting in front of very senior people. And I'm in the position where I have to tell them how I can help them run their business better. That's incredibly intimidating. And before each of those conversations, I talk to myself, and I say, you bring something to this conversation. You do have something to share that they may not know. And it's OK if they are senior. And it's OK that they're experienced. You have your own experience that you bring. And so I know that that's a very easy thing to say and a very, very difficult thing to do. And I think that as sort of a younger person or any person who is managing their career, you just have to practice it. And then I think we, as leaders, have a responsibility to coach and develop those people. And I take a lot of pride and care in doing that. And I think we've all talked about giving back, but particularly with women, but I think with everyone, when you're coaching and mentoring people, helping them address that gap, and reminding them that when they are feeling that confident, very often it's our own head trash, is, is really the way that I would recommend dealing with it. You know, I remember when I was when I was younger, I was I would when I had to speak up in meetings or get in front of a group and speak, I was always really nervous. And you know, I'd be like, Oh my god, my face is gonna flush and you know, all this kind of stuff when it's when I was younger. And the reality is is the more you do something and the more you do it, the way more comfortable you are doing it the next time and the next time and the next time until it sort of becomes natural. And so, you know, to to Natalie's advice there you just got to do it and try it once. And if you fail, who cares? Do it again, do it again, do it again. Because with practice, you know, comes whatever the statement is. You know, practice makes perfect, even though none of us are need to be perfect. But um, so, so there's that. And then I will also say just as, as a mentor to, to many people either who I've hired or who I help along the side, I think it's really important that you give the folks that you work with, your colleagues, you know, people that you mentor, opportunities to do those kinds of things that are hard for them. And getting them in front of senior people, you know, teaching them how to present in front of senior people, get up, giving them opportunities to be at conferences, because those are the kinds of things that help build your confidence over the years. Can I say something as well? Absolutely. That's a popular subject. I, I mean, I, I have definitely grown in confidence as I've got older. I would say I just used to worry all the time. I would go home. You, you mean you're driving home, you're on the train, and then you actually, the worst thing is when you're driving home and you forget you've driven 10 miles because your brain is worrying. <laughs> but if only I would said that, or if only I'd done that, oh my goodness, what am I going to do about that? And I, that still happens for me, but nowhere near as much. Um, if I'm going into a big meeting, I'm meeting someone for the first time. That's generally where it triggers me because I think, well, what are they going to think of me? And well, I try and turn it around and say, well, what am I going to think of them? Because it's new for them too. So why? And they're just a person. Whether they're more senior than me or not, they're just a person. I just learned to put stuff in boxes. I just, I, I actually have to train my mind that if something is really bothering me, and it's not helping me, it's not helping me progress. It's just worrying and it's distracting me and it's not letting me think clearly. I literally have learned psychologically to open this big box and put it in the box and shut the box and nail the box shut. <laughs> and every time it, you know, it pops into your head, I, I open that damn box again, I get my hammer out, I 
claw it up, and then I put it back in and I shut it again. And if I do that five, six, seven times, eventually that, that damn box stays closed. But I have to strenuously work at it. Um, and it's, it's always a work in progress, but I would say I just worry a lot less. I used to worry about everything. I'm, never, I'm not good enough, I'm gonna fail. I've just, I've just learned it's just not worth it. It doesn't help you, worry is not productive, it doesn't make you move forward, so I've just shut it in a box. But it's hard, because I'm a worrier. So I blame my mother, she worries about everything. <laughs> <laughs> She's made me a worrier. She still worries, I'm now the person that has to shut her box. <laughs> you know, I have to say, it's really inspiring for me, and I'm sure all the women and men sitting across the board, to hear that you know, women in your positions, you go through the same to the confidence gap. You have to do that self-talk, and it doesn't always come naturally, that you have to, it's an effort. And I think, you know, there was a, there's a famous quote that says, you know, there, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. And I think that's what you all are coming back to, is to, to say, look, you've got to, even if you're not believing in yourself, you've got to give it a go. You've just got to get up there. Even if you're feeling like, you know, your whole face is flushed, just get up there and have that conversation, take that shot, you know, take your worries and put them in a box. Um, so I, I think it's I think it's pretty inspiring to hear that from all of you. Uh, you know, who I wouldn't think that you know would go through that, but I, I think it's inspiring. Um, well, with that, we have uh, time for a few questions from the audience. Um, I'd love to see if anybody had has, has any questions before we sort of do closing. Sure. Would you like to come up? Um, so many of you mentioned the importance of mentors to your success. Um, so I was wondering what you think is a good way to identify or find a mentor, and then how to establish that mentor-mentee relationship with them. Um, I'll start. Okay. I'll make it short, because I'm sure others can. I mean, for me, the best way is to just find someone that you admire, and think about the qualities that you want to develop in yourself and find that in, in somebody who's done that, that, that's willing to help you, that you also click with personally. Um, I don't know if everybody would agree with that, but I think that's important. And that you trust. I mean, I know that that's pretty simple. And I really do agree with a lot of the women on this panel who said, and then just reach out to them. I think, you know, somebody in a book somewhere said, well, you don't like reach out to them and say, will you be my mentor? But um, reach out to them with some specific questions or ideas or things that you want to discuss. And I think most, most people are flattered by that and most people want to give back. And so that sounds pretty simple probably and obvious, but that would be, that would be my advice. Yeah, I was, I was going to say the same thing. All the people that mentored me, I've seen something in them that I think I can learn from. I admire them, I trust them. And you, you've got to be, I mean, some of my mentees tell me very personal stuff. You know, they'll tell me about their leaders and if they're struggling with their leaders, sometimes I know their leaders, so that's all, you know, you, it's a real trust thing you've got to build. So it's got to be two way as well, that I, tr you as a mentor trust them because I tell my mentors stuff about me that's deeply personal that I wouldn't want them to necessarily talk about, but I trust them too. So I think trust is really key. And you absolutely should ask. I, mean, I, I love being asked to mentor people. I find it incredibly flattering that someone would want half an hour of my time. Like, it's a great compliment when you're asked to mentor. And I, and I can't ever think of someone I've said no to. Sometimes I've asked them maybe to, someone asked me to mentor them every week and I said, well, maybe I can't do that. I try, to stick to every, I try to stick to every couple of months because I mentor a lot of people. I literally would only do mentoring if um, I did it every week. But uh, also what I've asked lots of people to help me and no one's ever said no. And same theme, you've got to ask in order to actually get it. Next question. Hi. Um, I watched, liked how Christine talked a lot about diversity of thought and sort of how, I was wondering how you recruit for that. You talked a little bit about changing the way that you do um, your job postings or if anyone else on the panel had any thoughts about how to sort of like recruit and retain diversity of thought because it's sometimes hard if you don't have anyone else like you that's thinking in the same way. Um, we're fortunate that our CEO it was a question I had with the interview. When I interviewed for 
to be number three. Um, I said, diversity is really important to me. And he's like, um, you want it to be, then you make it. You, you come up with a plan. And he said, actually, it's quite important to all of us, but we are going to make this happen. It's not going to be someone over there in a diversity role. It's actually going to be part of each of our roles. So that was important and, and good modeling out. Um, it's really, um, like I've just interviewed a couple people and I've missed things, but I definitely have had other people from different backgrounds who might not necessarily be in the reporting structure or the area that person's going to work because I think other folks from different backgrounds and ex expertise can see things in the person, good or bad, that you might miss. So it's really kind of bringing different voices and opinions into a process. Um, just like finding a diverse panel, well not necessarily this one, but <laughs> finding a diverse panel for a um, conference takes longer. Um, there's uh, read this blockchain conference. This guy's really known for not having a lot of women, and he's like, "Well, we didn't have time, and this and that." And I was like, "There are so many lists of top women in blockchain out there. You just Google it, right?" So you have to spend a little more time. And actually, at the New York Times, and I think this is something that maybe Linda Tepadino there, who ran New York Times when we were there, um, ran um, HR. We actually couldn't um, make an offer until we had a diverse pool. And that was a very new thing. And I've never forgotten that. And so when people have come to me and wanted to hire someone, I'm like, who have you talked to? And if they come from the same background or the same diverse uh, you know, ethnicity or, or even regional, I'm like, you got to look a little harder. This is going to take a little longer. Yeah, and I, I would just add, even just, just being conscious of it is really important. And there's lots of things, as Christine said, that you can put in your processes to do that. But you know, we all have unconscious biases for ourselves and, and very often just because you relate to somebody, you decide, oh, I, I like this person because they think like me, they act like the, me, they look like me. They're, and that's, you know, human in many ways just to kind of be connected to somebody who, you know, you feel that way about. But you have to be conscious and say, you know, it's not great for this organization to have another person who thinks just like me and who acts just like me and who, because that's not going to bring what the company needs. So it's, it's a really conscious effort to bring diversity in because it is much, much better for the company to, to have it. I just say one more thing that um, a very wise leader once t told me, which is you should hire people that make you feel uncomfortable. And um, my team sometimes make me feel very uncomfortable, yeah. and Danielle knows all about it. But they're very, very different personalities, and it's not just about gender diversity and background. And you know, I've got all sorts of nationalities in my team. I've got Canadians and Brits and Indians and Americans. It's the fact that they just they all think really differently, and sometimes that creates conflict. Mm -hmm. But that out of conflict comes great ideas. So I. I have to make myself afraid sometimes that, okay, it's going to be a bit conflictual and it's going to be a bit challenging, but that actually could be a good thing as long as it's, you know, the conflict's respectful. So I look for people who are very different to me and different to each other. Um, just want to add, I think um, many of us, we have a luxury in growing where we are. I think we also have the responsibility to pay it forward. And a couple of things that I always do, and I can give you an example. In our hiring process, I, uh, a couple years ago, I was hiring a VP of engineering. And the last two candidates, one is woman, one is a guy. And my boss was saying, no, definitely that guy. The guys are, you know, know architecture very well, articulate very well. So I finally say, no, I have to rewrite, I have to overwrite you. I mean, this is the best woman, and this is, you know, I know, well, blah, blah. So, and, and then my boss saying that, you know, you can hire her, but in the next three, six months, you have to prove that this person will work. And I actually think that was a complete unconscious bias at the time for my boss, um, but I really, really brought this person in, and I, you know, for the, next three to six months, I pretty much making sure this person is successful. As a matter of fact, this person is extremely successful in the company. I'm not going to name that company. And uh, um, so I think being as a leader, sometimes we have to overcome the unconscious biases around us. The other thing that I also do, particularly in the meeting situation, you see that women sometimes they say things, but sometimes they do say things. I think as a leader, I will call them out. You know, for example, hey, Linda, I think you have a really good point you want to say. What is it? I think sometimes really bring them sort of, okay, I'm being caught uh, on that, and maybe I, I have the freedom, I have the opportunity to say, 
I really want um, something that like that to to happen all the time. I think another thing you can do to your peer is to call it out. Hey, you know, uh, John or John, you know, whatever, uh, Jenny, you said something. Why don't you say it to others? And that's something we can really help each other. So hopefully that can. I think one of the things that I'm hearing is, you know, having all of you uh, as women leaders across the board, you've also taken this upon yourself to make sure that we get over that bias. And everybody has bias, Catherine, as you pointed out. Um, but, you know, making sure that in any situation as we're doing the hiring, we overcome our own biases. And, and when we do that, we inevitably inject diversity into our teams. Um, I think we have uh, time for one more question. Um, so we actually have a lot of young women in our company, which is really nice. We're trying to create more of a, a platform for them. Um, during our workshops, we talk a lot, and I found that a lot of them, and myself included, we don't know what we want. Um, we don't know where we're going. Um, I think it's easy when we know what we want to just go for it, and we're okay with putting our hands up. Um, but a lot of the time, it's we just don't know where we're going. Uh, so do you guys have experiences in a lot of naughty heads? <laughs> in that. Um, and if you do, what advice would you give to other young women facing that? So, I would say that I think that that's perfectly okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and advice, I, uh, the advice that I would give you is not to put time pressures on yourself to figure out what you want and to be okay with spending three years doing something and then looking back and saying, yeah, that wasn't the thing that I was going to do and being comfortable with that because you're going to have a long career ahead of you and those pivots are totally natural and healthy and okay. And um, that's just a lesson that I've learned in my career. And interestingly, someone, um, a colleague had asked me to talk to his daughter recently and she's a year out of college, and she was working at an agency, and she was passed over for a promotion that she thought she was going to get pretty soon after, and she just wanted some advice. And what she said to me was, well, I can't leave the agency now. Like, I've already sunk a year of my life into <laughs> this career. And I, and I literally, I was like, girlfriend, like, you can go like, do a completely different thing. And so I think that's OK when you're early on in your career. And I would embrace that, and I would just not have regret about having done something that ends up not being the thing that you end up doing, <laughs> if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I tried lots of things early in my career. I didn't get into technology till six years into my career, because um, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I left college. Well, I wanted to run a hotel until I figured out it was a bad idea. I had no idea. So I just literally just applied for lots of big companies with big names. That was my strategy. That was my great career strategy. And it worked, because I got a job with Amex. But I didn't know what I wanted to do at Amex. I literally had no idea. So I just tried different things. I did risk management. I did marketing. I did operations. And then I worked with a guy in tech. I, was a, I guess I was a product owner, although we didn't call them that then. And I just fell in love with tech and, and ended up in tech. But I didn't know what I wanted. And even now, although I've stayed in tech for my career since then, yeah, you know, every time something new happens, I'm never quite sure. Like, is this what I really want? I mean, I have to think about it. And so my advice would be, don't worry about it too much. I mean, I've worked for this. I've worked for 27 years nearly, which is terrifying. And I will probably have to work for at least another 10 to get the sort of life I want when I want to retire. So that's a long time. You can change direction. You can dis there are certain points in my career where I thought, I don't want to go any further. I'm happy, and especially when I had my son, and he was very young. I, I, was, I wanted to be a mom. I didn't want all the pressure, so I took a little bit of a slow down. And, and then he got older, and I decided, actually, maybe I do want to go further, and then I went further, and then I slowed down again. And my career is like this sort of go fast, slow down, go fast, slow down. The thing I've always held on to, whatever I've done, is I just do things I love. And if I don't love them, I'll find a way out of that. I'll create, I'll either try and change my job. I think someone said earlier, do, don't be bound by your job description. I have no idea what my job description is. I don't care. I do what I love. And so if I find I'm getting bored, stale, don't enjoy it, I find a way of pivoting to do something that I love. And that's what drives me every day. If I love it, 
80% of the time. She can never love something all the time. That's probably good enough. And I don't worry like I used to about, oh my goodness, I've been doing this for two years, I need to move. I, I just, if I feel I need to move, I let my instinct drive me now rather than a timetable. But when I was younger, I was all about timetable. Oh, I've been doing this job for three years and I haven't got promoted. Oh my goodness, the world is going to end. It won't end. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll, I'll add one thing, which is that, you know, the world we live in today is going to be different 10 years from now. Like, there was no internet when I started my, my career, so I could not even envision that. And, and some people wake up and say, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a scientist, I want to be an astronaut. Like, that was not me. I didn't know. I just kind of followed the path and opportunities that came to me, and some worked and some didn't. And so I, I kind of think about it as like a roving river. And when I get myself in these questions too, like should I do this or should I not, I think of it as a bit of a river and you're, you're crossing it on rocks. You know, and you're gonna step, sometimes you're taking big leaps on those rocks and sometimes you're taking sideways and sometimes, but over time you're going down the river. And so my advice is just step on the rock that comes next. You know, if it feels right to you and just move a little bit forward. Even if you don't know where it's taking you, you're, you know you're moving down the river in, in some way. And once you step on that rock, there's going to be a whole bunch of other rocks that come your way, and you're going to follow that path down. So don't, don't be afraid it, it, to not know, because probably most of us here didn't have any idea what, that we would be doing what we're doing now. And we're doing completely different things than the things we started doing. Yeah. Uh, I show them my resume. It, you, it's a disaster. It's not even, it's a meandering back and forth right. detours. I've been an, uh, an assistant three times in my life. One of them was to go to a tech company and learn from the ground up. Literally, but when you're an admin, this is a little tip, when you're an admin to a CEO, you learn everything. And I mean everything. You see everything, you get to see how businesses run. So I never think of things as a lateral move. I mean, granted, yes. I often look at people at the New York Times who are still there, and I'm like, wow, I could have been an SVP there right now if I had stayed. But I've run, like, I've had my own consulting thing twice. I've done tech. I've done a bunch of startups. I've done things I never would have done. And even though not all those choices were great, and maybe I left some jobs a little too early, the people I've met, I'm still very close with, especially the women, even in the jobs that were toxic and disasters. And so those are the things that actually keep you propelled. And once you taste the, take those risks, and each time you jump into something new, that, it's all that risk confidence. You build more, and then that next time there's a big risk, you actually, you're like, I've done this before, so I can do it again. Actually, this turned out to be a really great question because my last question from everyone was going to be, and if you have anything to add to this, is any piece of advice or experience that's been important to you in your career, um, and any risk that you feel has really paid off? Because I think um, hearing that would be very important as we, as we sort of wrap up. Start with the risk. I think um, um, at the time when I was at eBay and talking about doing something not in your responsibility, and I was running a platform, messaging platform, and um, it was in a turnaround 2000, I think 2008, the whole industry is in turn, even though eBay, like we never had kind of a layoff or anything, but we're shut down all the new initiative and everything. One of the first things they shut, shut down is actually mobile. Um, I think, to, yeah. And one thing what I, this doesn't make any sense, right? Why we actually slow down in the, probably the most critical thing in the future. So what I ended up to, to do is that I was just very curious about is I started to talk to the head of strategy, head of engineering, head of architecture. They all say, yes, 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 it's a great thing, but we can't do it. So what I ended up to say, I said, why don't you give me one person, give me one person. I actually ended up running a virtual team. That's not my responsibility. I started to build a mobile mobile app on the bit alert, like e eBay is about the bit alert. It turned out to be that that was uh, Apple, they just come out this notification service. So Steve Jobs actually downloaded a product that I, you know, my team built that was not even my team. And that was, I would say that is one of the risks that, that I took, I was like, wait a second, it's so easy. I didn't even, like everybody think this is the right thing to do. I think like just just doing it and ask for it and then later on they say, okay, why don't you run the mobile platform? 
and I had a zero mobile experience at the time. So one thing I would say is think about an opportunity that your company can benefit. I just saying that maybe I can do something about it. I think that's something I'm hoping. Um, I would say the biggest risk I've ever taken was more of a personal risk, although it was related. Well, I took two risks. I turned down a promotion um, about, oh gosh, maybe nine years ago. I was really worried about turning it down because I thought they'll never offer me another chance. That was my confidence. That wasn't them. That was me. And I turned it down because it would have meant moving to another country, and I didn't want to do that to my son at the point he was um, at in his education. And it was really hard because it was a great job. And then the person who took it, I didn't think they were as good as me, so that was even harder. <laughs> <laughs> and they ended up leaving under a cloud. And then, how many years later, I was then offered another chance for a promotion in a different country, and that time I decided to do it. So I moved to New York. That was a big thing. I, I never ever thought I'd move out of the UK. I'm a Brit through and through. <laughs> I always will be. I, I, I miss home, I love home. I'm very upset about the World Cup, but never mind. Um, <laughs> it was very hard personally, and I, you know, it was hard. For, I, I left my son, he was, tw he was 18. That was really, really difficult. He was just about, he'd just gone off to college. He didn't care. I cared. <laughs> and my dad got very sick just after I left. My dad was diagnosed with cancer two weeks after we moved to New York. And then, unfortunately, my dad died last year. So I then spent the next 18 months shuttling between New York and the UK and helping my mum nurse my dad. It was a really, it was the toughest thing I've ever done personally. It's been the toughest three years of my life because of all that's happened. But it's also been the most wonderful thing I've ever done as well because I've learned so much, I've grown so much, I've made some incredible friends. Um, my heart will always lie in England, but in New York's a pretty special place as well. And I have made some deep, including this wonderful lady, some deep friendships. And New York's an amazing place to work, but it was fraught with personal challenge and pain, and it was very, very hard. And honestly, the job was my, it's probably my salvation in the last three years. It kept me going. Um, but that was, I didn't realize, I knew it was a bit of a risk when I took it, but I didn't realize how big a risk it was and how painful and hard it was going to be because of all the personal things that happened during that three-year process. But it was worth it, for sure. Living in another country is an amazing experience. And you may speak the same language as us, but believe me, you're nothing like <laughs> it. <laughs> so you essentially put yourself in that uncomfortable zone when you moved here, it sounds like. Um, so, you know, I think we've heard, you know, for a lot of great things today, and I just wanted to kind of summarize and, um, you know, as, and as we take something away from, uh, from today. Some of the themes that I heard were careers not about working hard. It's about, not just about working hard, it's about the influence that you have. It's the networking, it's everything else combined together. Um, being comfortable with being uncomfortable, I think Angie, you said that, um, that it resonated. Um, failing. And, and feeling comfortable with that feeling. Um, I think someone talked about being a lifetime learner and being that purple cow. Um, asking for help, you know, and I think these are all, you know, great lessons from women that I, you know, you all are incredible. And, and learning that you all have those moments of weakness, of worrying, of not feeling like you're 100% when you're raising your hand at something. If they have that, then you have to know that it's, it's not just common, it's okay, and it's okay to still raise your hand and still continue to go for what it is that you're passionate about. Passion is the other thing that I heard over and over, is following your passion. You know, you came to New York to follow your passion. You've done all the stuff that you've done, and you know, um, to follow your passions and taking that next step forward. And it's okay to not know what it is that you're doing, what you want to do, but as long as you're following that path to your passion and that next step, it, it can't stir you very far away from success. Um, and then the last thing was, you know, just making sure that you have that coach and that mentor as you are continuing to take that risk, because you will have those moments of self-doubt. Uh, you'll have those moments where you're not really sure if this is gonna work out, and having that mentor really seems to be the other thing that everybody had in common that really grounded you. So with that, I really, really want to thank our panelists. I've learned a lot tonight. Thank you guys, girls, 
so much <laughs> for being here, for not just sharing um, how you've gotten here, but sharing some really personal stories that I think um, hopefully our audience will also take and, and be able to implement in their own careers as they move forward. Uh, please join me in giving them a great hand.